Hey there entrepreneurs, my name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives and thought leaders and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Ben Escrow to the show. Ben is the co-founder of Elemental Foundations. Elemental Foundations is a supplements company which prides itself in creating products that are formulated and peer reviewed by industry experts and third party tested to prove they are dr drug free and contain the ingredients and doses you pay for. And today I'm, I'm going to ask Ben a few questions about his entrepreneurial journey and some of the strategies and tactics that he has used to start and grow his business. So thank you so much for joining me today at Trip Talks, Ben. Thank you for having me. So was that the correct description of your product? Can you share a little bit about your company and what kind of products uh, you're selling? Yes. Uh, only real quick correction I'll make is um, it, it's formulations. I don't know if you said foundations or formulations, but uh, basically, and this will this will bleed into my answer as well. Uh, the reason we call it elemental formulations is largely because it's it's chemistry inspired. Um, you know, a little bit of our branding sort of utilizes the Breaking Bad esque branding with periodic table inspiration and. Uh, it, it largely comes from both the approach we take or, or I take in formulating the products and then a lot of my academic background, uh, kind of having a hybridization of uh, nutrition, sports nutrition, uh, education, and then pharmacology and, and pharmaceutical chemistry. Um, now, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. So uh, if, if yeah, we can round back to that. So, so that's, that's a good overview of the company. What products actually are you selling? I, I think I, on your website, also, I saw, is it mostly like protein based supplements? Yeah, so right now we sell, uh, we sell a protein, a whey isolate protein powder. We sell a few different forms of pre-workout. And then we have a cognitive enhancer, nootropic, which is a fairly new category. And then we have a few of the basics like, uh, like creatine. So we, we launched the brand uh, last year uh, we, we were founded and we just started. So we are still building out the product line. And right now I'd consider we, we really just have the bare essentials uh, and we're trying to sort of expand the flavor options and some of the, you know, uh, sort of finding what, what's our best product mix uh, right now and really just trying to really dig, dig into what, what's hitting and working best. But, um, you know, since I had come from a prior company and had run it for a decade called De Novo Nutrition, uh, I had some of the, that idea going in, but the reality is the supplement supplement industry is evolving so quickly now with bigger and bigger playing players coming into it, uh, large food corporations like Post and uh, large supply chain uh, players like Glanbia, um, and even some ph pharmaceutical companies who are having supplement arms of their sort of umbrella companies uh, or, or cosmetics uh, companies getting into it. So that, that's all to say that, you know, what may have worked even three years ago, you can't necessarily rely on working now, uh, even, you know, even with the way marketing's changing, social media marketing and all that stuff. But I, I won't get too far into that for, for fear of tangent, tangent, tangenting mm -hmm. way too far off for five minutes. Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll leave it there. So, so yeah, I mean, it seems like, uh this industry supplements industry is really just a very competitive place like i think there's a lot of players and so how do you actually differentiate your product like if someone is going to buy let, let, let's say a whey protein mm -hmm. and you know either they go online and search for it or they go to a retailer there's so many different options um how does how how do you bring bring a, a customer to your brand as opposed to you know them just going and buying something that is tried and true or, or you know, ha have been in business for a long time. Sure, yeah. I mean, from the customer perspective, I totally understand that it's overwhelming. The amount of choices now are overwhelming. And to stand out in this market, the window's closing, like it's getting harder and harder and harder. And that's something I've noticed over time. So the fact that we don't, you know, we are still bootstrapped, uh, we don't have this enormous marketing budget because many companies, you know, very large companies, 70, 80% of their budget for operations is marketing. Um, and we just don't have that. So finding really organic strategies that we can utilize um, that really separate us, uh, 
of course, I'd like to think since I am the product formulator, I'd like to think that it's our formulations that make us stand out. And uh, it's because we either, you know, find novel ingredients that aren't necessarily being used or underutilized or they're being utilized for the wrong purposes and putting them in, in not just the correct doses, um, but for a, a better uh, a better purpose than they've traditionally been used for. And then not just marketing so heavily, but backing up everything we say with objective standards, meaning like when we finish a product, there is no requirement necessarily to third party test it for potency. Um, there is no requirement to ban substance test. You just have to do the basics, which are, you know, do a micro bio screen, heavy metals testing, make sure it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, but a lot of that, those extras are optional. So, you know, the position we're taking is since there's no external requirement on us to do that regulation, we're self-regulating. Um, and that does come with added costs, but it gives the consumer a, a much much greater comfort in that this isn't just this marketing machine. Like we, we will uh, make claims, but there's a lot more comfort in the claims we're making because we know our product is good and we are, you know, it's not just we're doing the testing, we're actively putting it out there for you to read. So one of the things we have on our label is a QR code and it's not just, you know, a pass fail. We actually show the quantities of where every, all the materials in, in the supplement test out. And, um, you know, to kind of explain how things have evolved, that's that's a large aspect of the evolution of supplements is, I, I hate to use the generic term evidence-based, but, mm. you know, I think large companies have caught on to the fact that there's a much more demand for quality supplements. Um, there, it's a much more educated consumer base where they're not just going to buy into a proprietary blend, especially as you get into these niche markets like powerlifting, which, which we're largely in, drug-tested powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, there's a lot more demand for uh, a lot more skepticism towards the marketing. And there's a lot more demand uh, for doing higher quality things and, and not just, you know, pixie dusting, as they call a bunch of ingredients in and saying it does all, it does 10 things at once, but no one thing great. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, as that continues to take over the industry, like I said, the window starts to close because what may have been a competitive advantage for us before, uh, which would just be not using terrible ingredients. Now, most, even the big companies have con caught onto that. And I think a, a major separating factor now is I'd say most companies are using higher quality ingredients, but a big separating factor is the potency testing. And then the second one is the dosing where, you know, they'll say they're using proper dosing or they'll say they're using a certain good ingredient to make a claim, but they put it in there at half the dose that it should be. Mm. Okay. And for the user, the benefit is when they are doing a certain sport or certain kind of bodybuilding activity, um, it really just enhances that performance. Uh, I mean, protein is protein, right? But I, I'm, I'm assuming other supplements are really meant to give them that leverage to go the extra mile, I guess. How do you describe this? I mean, this is not steroids, right? No, 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 okay. no. Yeah. So we, we do really cater to drug tested athletes. Uh, that's why we do. And I didn't make that super clear. Um, so we do the potency testing and then we do another testing, which is the banned substance free testing as well um, to have that validity because, you know, whether or not you're super involved in these markets, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, there's been a lot of high profile athletes testing positive and then blaming it on a supplement and saying it was a tainted supplement. So, um, you know, we do our best to even just remove that as being an option uh, because that, that has happened both in more mainstream um, sports, but even in, in, in our community with the, the drug tested powerlifters that, that, or bodybuilders that, that happens uh, a lot as well. Um, so uh, if you can rein me back in, please. Uh, oh, you, as you asked about the purposes of, of the products. Yeah. So, so yeah, largely, you know, whey protein, uh, it, it can be used just as a convenient protein replacement. So you don't always have to be carrying around, you know, a hunk of meat with you or, you know, like yogurt or, or foods. You can conveniently uh, get a really high dose of protein uh, that tastes good in a very convenient, you know, way, uh, way <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> um, 
And you know, a, a large angle that we take on it is that there's still many, many products that they've hung around because I think marketing has been so effective on them, but in reality, the evidence just isn't there uh, for them. Mm -hmm. And it continues to sort of not indicate that they're, they're uh, beneficial. One of them being branched chain amino acids. They're very important. It's just, they're, they're three essential amino acids in the diet. They're really specific to um, starting the, the, it's called muscle protein synthesis. So starting the response to a meal to, to building muscle. Um, now it's important to, to note that they start the process. They don't continue it, it, it going. So um, if people just relied on branch chain amino acids in their diet and they didn't eat complete proteins, then they wouldn't gain, gain muscle. It's important to note that. Um, so one of the angles that, that we're taking with our way is that you know, people justify using branch chain aminos by saying, well, it's good tasting flavored water. So it's almost like they accept that, you know, they're getting placeboed and they're paying, you know, $50 for this, this jug of not really getting what they're being promised mm -hmm. because it tastes good and it flavors their water good. Mm -hmm. So basically our angle is, well, if we can match somebody on that really good fruity flavored taste um, and give them a complete protein, we can check both boxes. So uh, we take a different angle on making our protein where uh, it's actually watermelon whey flavored. Um, and, and I'm pretty proud. Like we we've been able to really mimic like watermelon candy flavors, uh, in a way that people can't even believe that they're, they're drinking whey protein. Um, so we, we really try to find ways to reinvent products that might be boring otherwise in a market where you can get vanilla and chocolate protein anywhere. You can get it at Walmart now. Um, so, you know, finding, again, even if they're tiny areas for relatively tiny areas for competitive advantages, uh, I'm always looking for that as, as the formulator. And what is your product development process? Like, you know, what is, how do you go about making sure that you have the flavors and the, the quality product coming together and, and working for the, the customer? So honestly, a lot of it comes from testing. Uh, I mean, I, I have been a self-described supplement junkie since I got into fitness, which was like, I was 18 years old, like as a senior in high school. And of course, you know, that marketing is very, very effective where you almost believe that you need supplements in order to make progress. Uh, I think I've been fascinated by the chemistry, the botany, the, the nutrition, all of the angles that come into producing supplements. Um, so a lot of it is being a, a supplement user, um, having a lot of experience in having used supplements that I was interested in working and then taking the academic end of reading the research and finding things that are potentially interesting leads, testing them out myself, doing small batch, um, doing my own quality control testing. So, you know, if I'm going to buy a raw material and we're, gonna, we're thinking about putting it in, into a product, I'll actually do the anal analytical testing myself. I have a machine called a, a, an FTIR, which is an analytical instrument. It's a, a quick and easy way to test the identity of a raw material, assuming that it's pure. Um, I'm able to do that first bat off uh, where, you know, I'm not just relying on the manufacturer saying, uh, this is creatine monohydrate, because mm. that does happen where, you know, it's, it's not as common um, as it may have been 10 years ago, but it does still happen where quality control can be an issue. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm testing, you know, raw material ingredients individually, seeing, uh, you know, if, if they seem to have, you know, the effect that's promised, or at least some of the research has indicated. And then I'm building that into uh, usually using a pathway approach uh, from pharmacology of, okay, well, if this ingredient works on this pathway, how can I use another complementary pathway to, to enhance the effect of that? So instead of just selling, let's say, um, caffeine pills, uh, I, I know that something else that works on neurotransmitters that's complementary to caffeine, like uh, huperzine A, which it works on acetylcholine, um, if, if I combine that uh, in some type of matrix alongside caffeine and huperzine and maybe another source of choline, I can create a whole different effect and experience than just caffeine itself. Okay. And uh, so when you started this business, what was, um, can you share a little bit about, you know, what kind of, uh, it seems like you started, a boot started um, 
uh, boot, bootstrapped uh, your business. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit, you know, what kind of investment went into the process? I know you have uh, a co-founder also. Can you share the story of, you know, what, what made you actually start this business? Sure. Uh, so I'd have to go way back to, you know, like I said, DeNovo was the initial company and that, that was founded in 2011. And that was just me. Um, that was me, like I said, being a supplement junkie and being really just, I'd say passionate and curious about how these companies were developing supplements. And I was working a job at the time I was right out of undergrad. Uh, I was working a government nutrition job and living at home. And basically I took all of my extra money into finding out how to source raw materials and uh, make my own blend. So I, I had a food chemistry book that I used to start make my initial formulations. Hmm. Um, I'd say they were a lot more alchemist than they, than they were chemist, meaning like, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd build them in a very iterative process uh, and then just play. And I, I think play, you know, I, I agree with almost the Einstein quote is like play is the, hmm. is, is the mother of creativity. And um, I guess I was kind of lucky where I stumbled into getting my first whey formula uh, right in terms of sweetness and flavor and mouthfeel and experience. I had my parents try it for the first time and my, both of them like swallowed the whole thing down, you know, without even putting the, the glass down. And my dad just looks at me and goes, you're going to be a millionaire. Now that hasn't happened, but <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, I always had a lot of support from my family. And, and the reality is, is I started, like I said, you know, self-funded. I wasn't mm. trying to make a profit. I was just trying to make, make products and, and see if people like them. Mm. Um, so I really didn't turn profit for the first year or two, uh, probably losing money. And I found ways to make it work. Now, this was an environment that would not fly anymore because there was no GMP regulations. Basically, I was small batching mixing uh, using a cement mixer. So obviously mm. not a cement mixer that was mixing cement. You mm. know, I, I bought a new one. I sanitized it. I had known how to do sanitization and food safety from doing my RD and my nutrition undergrad. And I just applied, uh, I took all these things I learned from these different areas and used it to, uh, I would say against the odds, start a supplement company, uh, mm. on a very, very low budget. Um, and then just figure it out. So basically uh, what started selling in the beginning was what sold best were proteins. So mm -hmm. I would just keep making new protein flavors uh, at like at year two, um, when we did start to you know make a little more money, I had like 20 some protein flavors. Uh, so I, I found vendors that were willing to work with somebody who was small scale, uh, who we still use today for things like flavors. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just sort of took it step by step. And, and, and I think what kept me in, and, and I totally agree with the Steve Jobs quote, is like, you have to be a little bit insane. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's not logical at all. It wasn't rational. Like um, I was, any, any spare time I had, I was mixing products, packaging them, trying to make new formulas. And I just did it because I loved it and I still do. Um, so again, you know, I'm sorry for always dragging on, but there's, there's so much, you know, over 10 years, there's so much, so many different things to talk about. It's almost like talking about it just brings it all back. And it's just mm -hmm. sort of flows, you know, are you, are you a bodybuilder yourself? Is that the reason yeah, you so, originally got into it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't compete anymore. Uh, I did compete in bodybuilding um, and then transitioned to powerlifting because I was more interested in being judged on what felt like an objective scale rather mm -hmm. than, you know, like how my muscles insert to each other. Like, it's, hmm. it's either you lift the weight or, or you don't in, in powerlifting. So uh, I, I I did compete in both. And that's really what sort of got our our, our grassroots start um, from being involved in bodybuilding forums back in the day before Facebook and Instagram and major social media was a thing. Um, but I, I don't compete any longer. Uh, I, I still lift and, and, and love lifting and I still, you know, coach powerlifting and stuff and do nutrition. But uh my let's just say the sports of powerlifting didn't love me back as much as i loved it and i'm just a little too tall uh for it so i've had some joint issues that have have, have stopped me from being able to pursue it competitively still so so you started off with one company and now you've started a second company what made you to 
Uh, did you um, sell the last company? Did you close it? Uh, how did you transition into this new? Uh... Yeah, um, I, I wish I wish it was a positive. Um, it, it was largely uh, COVID induced things that were very difficult to survive. One of them being supply chain. Um, you know, it, it was just a lot of factors. Uh, so it just seemed like at that time, the, the best move was uh, dissolve and start fresh. I mean, there, there's a really long story to that. That's the short version. Um, the slightly longer version is like, you know, I think one of the interesting ends of business is uh, it's a challenge, especially when you're in partnerships. So I started the company. I started De Novo myself. Uh, I had a partnership with two partners. Uh, kind of from year three to year five or six, that partnership dissolved. I went back to running it myself for a year or two, had another foreign partner um, for two years, and then COVID hit, and that just, you know, made everything that much more difficult. Uh, and, and you know, that dissolved. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things involved in running a business beyond just making products and supplements. Um, so I, again, I realize I'm getting off the original topic of your question, but uh, so let's, I am... so, yeah, let me ask you this though. So I know, you know, business partnerships are challenging, like what has Fair. been, um, and I know you have a partner right now also with your Correct, new, yeah. new business. I mean, what have you learned about being, um, being, uh, or, or having a business with other partners and what can other entrepreneurs learn from your uh, experiences? I, I think. I'm constantly humbled by it. Um, I, I think I'm still learning. Uh, I think you really have to learn how to be a team in, in all scenarios. Uh, I think you need to be able to see things from multiple perspectives, not just your own. Uh, I think I've, I've you know, also seen very difficult scenarios where, you know, when things become too much about a single person's success or it being about less about the company and more about an individual that that gets very dangerous and and I think it's difficult like I think I think it's very true what what people like Elon Musk have said uh which is like you know being an entrepreneur is like chewing glass and staring into the abyss uh I think there's it's very lonely at the top meaning like when you're when you have the weight of everything of the business on your shoulders and you're responsible for other people uh, trying to hold it together. Um, I think it's very, very challenging. And, and I would never dissuade somebody from trying because um, I know, you know how, how much more popular it is for people to start their own business and, and do their own thing. But I think you should come in with a healthy level of understanding um, what's involved in the challenges. And the challenges don't start, I think, as you move up, you know, when we've grown. Uh, and had these inflection points in growth. It's almost like the rapper quotes, like more money, more problems. Uh, it, it, you, you just like the problems scale up as well. And um, it's, it's difficult, especially when you're bootstrapping and there's not money to pull from and mm. doing it basically for much, much less than your, your effort, your time and your value entails. Um, I think those are all recipes for frustration. And I think one of the things for me that I'm constantly, it's always a work in progress is don't let that frustration bleed out into things that are unrelated. Like you always, like I said, you always have to find a way to have the positive angle and keep the motivation and keep, um, keep everybody, you know, in, in it. And, and that's, that's a challenge, especially when you, you have your own personal life, you know, like one of the things that happened, uh, when in De Novo in, in the second partnership is, you know, I had a lot of major health things going on where, like I said, with powerlifting, you know, I had some joint issues. Like I had trouble uh, just getting around day to day because of my back um, there. And it, it changed my life, you know, it, it, it changed it largely. And it's impossible for those things not to infuse into the day to day of the business. And like, when you're in pain, you're not the happiest person and the most pleasant person to be around. It's yeah. then when you have, you know, everything on top of that with customer issues, supply chain issues, trying to scale a business. Yeah, it, it's a lot. So I think, I think if there's anything to say, it's when you need time, take it and do everything you 
can and need to to have your balance because it can be a very imbalanced life if you allow it to be. And as a person who kind of needs work and feels almost panicked if I don't have enough work to do, that can be a very dangerous um, roulette to play, I think, uh, as an entrepreneur, because there's always going to be work, always. Yeah, yeah. So can you share a little bit about, you know, you're starting your new business, what kind of things have you done to really launch it um, and attract customers and um, re really, uh, you know, how are you getting your first customers and, and um, getting traction? Word of mouth has always been big for us. Uh, it was in the beginning and, and I'd say it still is. Obviously, you know, with social media, having athletes, uh, I don't love the term influencer, but we'll use it because it's sort of appropriate here. Um, you know, having the right people, keeping the right people, which is difficult because now, like I said, bigger players are getting into the space. So there's larger marketing budget budgets and, you know, the, the bottom line, like the, the blunt reality of it is no matter how much of a personal relationship there may be with people, if someone could offer to pay them double what you're able to offer them, it's hard to keep them. Uh, you know what I mean? And, um, just doing our best with that to survive in, in that landscape, um, trying to find unique ways to incentivize beyond money, doing things best we can with money, um, trying to keep people involved in, in, in a business that uh, is not just us so much running the show, like uh, trying to, like one of the things we're trying to do now is collaborations with our athletes where, you know, they can do like signature products where we give them creative influence on the label and the flavor and stuff like that, where I can, it, it's more collaborative. Um, and yeah, I, I'd say, always trying to find like never thinking we nailed it always trying to find a, a new and unique angle to take on things but i think if i was to pin it down to a few things it would be trying to always have some type of social presence um word of mouth uh in in communities uh that that you know you're actively involved in or you have any type of name in and then i think the big one is from a formulation perspective not just doing what everybody else is doing like mm. finding a way to keep things unique. And last one is regular launch cycles. Um, because in supplements, I'm sure this is true more universally, um, not just in supplements, but if you're not launching something new routinely, there's a lot, there's a lot of attrition. There's a lot of fall off. People get bored, people look elsewhere. Uh, so this, there's always gotta be something to keep people excited about. So you, you uh, manage your own manufacturing, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, uh, do you, do you have to keep in mind that if you create a batch of products, you don't create so much that it, it goes bad after a certain time? How Absolutely. do you, how do you, how do you manage uh, that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it's largely just on, you know, historical uh, data that we have, knowing that we'll be able to sell a certain amount within, you know, the time that's well before expiration. We've never run into that where we've had on hand a product that's expired. Um, we, you know, we do have inventory software where we can have predictions of, you know, what number, what's our average number of sales. Uh, we, we run, we use Shopify as a platform. So we use mm -hmm. an app, some, I forget what it's called, but it's an inventory app that, you know, that projects certain things. Um, that does help. Uh, you know, the interesting part of that challenge is, there's always this need to scale up to enhance or improve your, your profit margin. Um, and that's the challenge because, you know, you need to have enough cash flow to buy that next tier where you get, you know, the per unit pricing improvement, but you need to make sure you're going to sell it. And one of the interesting things that exist in the supplement space or the consumable space is the minimums that exist from manufacturers it's not, you can't like, let's say you need to run 5,000 units. You have mm. to run it in one flavor. You can't spread that across multiple flavors. Yeah. So that takes a big budget. I mean, it takes money very much to make money in supplements. Um, but so, so largely we're, we're not, we never get too aggressive with buying bigger runs, but I think the, the, the issue and the drawback of that is it does keep us sort of locked into an area of profit margin that over time needs to improve. So you're, you're focusing mostly just on the direct to consumer on selling through your website. Are you selling on Amazon? Do you uh, want to be in retail? 
Uh, so right now we deal with, um, the only retail we have is we deal with smaller, uh, you know, independent supplement stores. Um, my, my local gym here carries our stuff as well. We have a gym in Canada or a distributor chain called Supplement World that carries us there. Um, in the past, we've had some, uh, some worldwide, like on Australia, some chains of supplement retailers that have carried us. But for the most part, we are, we're, we're direct to consumer. Um, we find that sort of works well for us right now um just on a management thing because we're a small team you know Mm. it's really just the two uh the two co-founders and then we have an employee team of like three so it's it's not not this you know mega mega team Mm -hmm. um we're not on amazon right now i was with denova but man we had so many nightmares of experiences with them that Mm. it's just hard to go back when They have our customer data. Uh, Don't like that part. Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, they're a huge retailer. They're they're a huge platform, but you you don't have your customer data. It's theirs. And when they have when they have your inventory, uh, again, you know, just to be blunt about it, they they just don't give a shit about it. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we've had to pull inventory from them. They sent it back to us, and thirty percent of it was destroyed, and they did nothing to compensate us for that. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to you know come back with a new company and be willing to eat a chunk out of your margin because your, your uh, drop shipper doesn't care about, about your product. Um, like we're just not in a position where, you know, we can justify that right now. Um, so yeah, we're, we're largely, we're largely B2C, um, and really trying to work more so with, um, smaller, uh, mom and pop supplement, supplement retail stores. So when, when you had the opportunity to start this business a second time around, um, did you ever think, you know, maybe not, you know, I've, I've learned everything that I wanted to learn about the supplements. Maybe now I should try a different industry or a different business. Um, uh, have, you, have you ever had that thought? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another great question. Uh, and 100% I have. Um, I mean, again, the reality is, you know, in something like coaching, it's all time investment and intellectual overhead. Um, so, you know, your margin of that is nearly 100%. So when you're talking raw business, it makes more sense to do that. But uh, I think what keeps me in is like, I'm just so fascinated by, like I, everything I said before, you know, the pharmacology, the all the nuances of supplements, it, it, it just... I think it keeps me intellectually engaged. Um, But I've definitely had a lot more stress than uh, than necessary in doing it. Um, I've danced back and forth about going into other things. But I think the problem is, you know, whenever I've looked or, you know, sort of dipped my foot in, I think the issue is you don't have that creative freedom to make the types of products that that we make and that we've shown there's a demand for in Mm -hmm. in the market. Um, You're usually, you know, given these very, very firm boundaries of what you can create. And there's already more than enough products out there doing that. So I think if I was going to go anywhere else, um, I'd probably try to either go back into academia or go into pharma, but that's just not as, that's not as exciting for me. Um, cause you know, I know a lot of people, uh, I, I'm, as much as I like being a lab rat, I, I don't want to be a lab rat in, in, in that sense. Um, I like to be tied to the, the end product of, of what I'm making and being able to infuse a very, you know, big part of my passion and creativity in, into the product. And I think that gets lost when it's like more of a big box thing, you know? Mm-hmm. I think I read somewhere uh, that you were featured on a Tim Ferriss blog or something. Is that? Yeah. Fair? So can you share that story? So, sure. Um, so one of, one of my, my friends and, and honestly, someone I really look up to uh, is a, he's a researcher at USF. Um, he studies ketogenic diets and, and ketone supplements um, for really for medical therapies, uh, largely for cancer and, you know, certain other conditions sort of related to that, like medical interventions with, with ketosis. And, um, he was on Tim Ferriss because, because of that, talking about that, that topic. And 
uh, he mentioned our product. So at that time, we had just launched a new product called Utopia, which we still sell under, under Elemental. And it was it was really pretty new and innovative at that time when, you know, one of the categories, really the main category of caffeinated products that were sold in the fitness space were pre-workouts. So mm. if it was caffeinated, it was usually a pre-workout and that's it. And we were really one of the first um, brands to launch a caffeinated product that was geared towards really a pre-work, not pre-workout. So you could use it. You don't have to be using it for the gym. You could use it to study. You could use it to do anything where you need to really get kind of tunneled into the work and it's not going to make you agitated, distracted, that all the traditional things that you get from, you know, too much caffeine alone, this doesn't happen from this, this product and formulation. And um, he had used it. He really liked it. He mentioned it on there. And then that kind of got re reblogged and shared within, within Tim Ferriss's sort of uh, inner circle. And, and that was really a major inflection point in growth for us. Like we sold out almost completely within a couple of weeks of our inventory. Um, yeah, that was, that was a big inflection point of growth for us. So since you, you're so passionate about uh, supplements, can you share like um, any tips or anything, um, anything that works really well in the, in the supplement um, industry that, that could be beneficial for people? I know you had mentioned, you know, there, there's like placebo effect and those kind of things. Yeah. But is there something, one or two things that you know actually works really, really well? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's not going to be the most exciting answer in the world, but really the thing that we have that's most established both in the research and in, you know, the supplement industry is creatine. Uh, you know, most companies are trying to create the next creatine, so to speak. Um, and just because it, it continues to be validated uh, through research, it's got the most human studies in it. Um, for strength and power. So basically anybody who's trying to improve muscle mass or strength, uh, pretty much across the board, I'd recommend creatine. And what's great about it is you can use it pretty much from, you know, adolescence in, into old age, you know, that there it's because it's been so widely researched, it's been looked at in all those populations you know, there's a lot of misconceptions still about it. Um, you know, it's not an anabolic steroid. It's, it's a component of proteins. Like if you eat meat, you get some creatine, just not a high enough dose. Um, and it's something that exists in your muscles, uh, there already. Uh, the only thing you're doing by taking creatine is maximizing that store and having more of that available to utilize mm. because how it's used in normal physiology is anything that's a short burst of energy. Like if you needed to go sprint as hard as you could for 10 seconds, that's using, you know, anaerobic uh, pathway, which first is creatine and then it's, then it's glycolysis. Um, so, so creatine is, is really, you know, we've just found an area to exploit in physiology with creatine. Uh, and, you know, it, it really took off in the nineties and it stuck around and, nothing fancy is required like plain old creatine monohydrate is mm -hmm. super effective and it works and it's great i think you know the basics uh i will always harp upon so you know a good form of whey protein um is going to help you get enough protein in it's also a high source of uh one of the most important amino acids leucine um for starting that process of growing new muscle muscle protein synthesis um so that's very good uh, i think you know Caffeine is tried and true. Everybody knows about it. I think what has really blossomed now uh, as the market has expanded and sort of new ingredients have come in is some additional products alongside caffeine, you know, things like huprazine, like cholinergic ingredients, huprazine, citicoline, uh, alpha GPC. Um, and then it, it's, I guess if I was to really refine it down, I'd say certain amino acids are very beneficial, certain non-protein aminos like creatine, certain amino acids like citrulline, um, things like nitrates, which are in beetroot juice, um, and you can get supplements for it as well. And then some of those sort of stimulant area ingredients uh, that, that work on neurotransmitters are, are beneficial. There's, I mean, there's, there's so many ingredients in the space. It really depends on what purpose you're talking about. Like if you said blood glucose regulation, I'd probably have a whole other list of supplements, but I'd say the basic list is right there of, you know, if someone's just getting started in supplements for fitness goals and trying to improve body composition, I'd start with those ones. So I have been a vegetarian all my life, right? So 
I'm assuming my my creatine levels are relatively low. Absolutely. So if I so if I start taking that supplement, what can I expect to see maybe like three months, six months down the road? Like what effect do you think it's going to make for me? Yeah. So again, I think that's a that's an excellent excellent practically rooted question um, because I think most people come in and because marketing exists the way it does, people have completely inappropriate expectations of what they're going to get. Um, now, I, I think the first uh, preface to that answer is you got to be lifting if you're expecting to get, you know, the best results from, mm-hmm. from taking any, any type of supplement. Uh, if you just took creatine alone, you probably would have a minor change in lean body mass, maybe a pound or so. Um, if you lifted and you took creatine long-term and you saturated, cause you're definitely would not be, you know, you would not have saturated muscle creatine content as a vegetarian because mm-hmm. you're not getting any through your diet from, from meat. And um, I think realistically, you'd probably first notice better, let's say you already were lifting, you'd first notice some improvements in strength and ability to do more reps um, at certain weights. So that would be the most apparent thing within a couple of weeks. And then over the course of a few months, you'd probably notice, I I hate using these terms because they're so loosey goosey, but your muscles looking a little fuller. Um, if I was to try to quantify that into, into weight gain in terms of muscle weight, uh, or lean tissue weight, I'd say a few pounds, but Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is significant. Um, because most people like imagine walking through the, the grocery store and looking at, you know, a pound or a kilo of tissue, that's a lot of lean tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, and your body really doesn't want to do that. So, um, to get that any additional on top of what you get from exercise alone um, is, is beneficial. I mean, even anabolic steroids, you know, they can create growth, but it's, I I don't think it's to the magnitude that the, the common person expects, you know, you don't go from average Joe to Mr. Olympia by using one, one round of anabolic steroids. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, final question before we move on to our uh, rapid fire segment. I know in every entrepreneur's journey, there's always, you know, mistakes made, failures, lessons learned. Can you share maybe in your uh, journey, entrepreneurship journey, uh, maybe a big failure, a big mistake made, and what was the lesson for you, for you and what can other entrepreneurs learn from it? I think the biggest one for me, it's almost like I'm looking in the mirror saying this too, is, um, you know, running a business, it's, it needs passion. Passion is an important component of sticking in when things get tough, but I think you need to be able to be adaptable to what the customer says they want. And as much as that's, it's, it's your business and you need to make the business decisions. Uh, you can't be too stubborn in the business. You want wanting the business to be the way you want it to be. You know, you have to find a happy middle ground. And I think you know, certain things I'd love to be a certain way just aren't that way. Like marketing is a requirement. People aren't just going to knock down the doors because you've built a great formula. Uh, if no one ever hears about it, um, then you haven't built, you can't build a good business on that. Um, you know, it's not just about the theoretical. Uh, so, you know, I, I love the Elon Musk model, but the reality is, you know, like where he says, we don't have a marketing budget, you know, it's all R&D. I mean, he was a billionaire before he you know, he started those things. He made a great product in a different sector that does reward, you know, that type of innovation, whereas supplements aren't that. So um, I think, yeah, I, I think you always need to keep, stay as humble as you can, because uh, if not, you'll be humbled by your business crumbling. Um, and taking outside input and not automatically shutting it down because it hurts. Uh, you need to be willing to digest data uh, and see it, I think, realistically and neutrally and make better decisions based upon that. Because if you avoid it either for fear or too emotionally, um, you're not gonna make great decisions. And I think those are all threats to survivability and sustainability of a business. So now we're going to move on to the rapid fire round. And in this round, I'm going to ask you a few questions and you have to answer them maybe in one word or two words. I'll do my best. Okay. So the first one is uh, one book recommendation that you would uh, suggest to entrepreneurs or business people in 2022 and why? 
I'm going to give you two. Um, one of them is called the elephant in the brain. I think it's very fascinating. I already, already failed too many. Uh, the second one is uh, when we cease to understand the world. Um, they're not so much business books, but I think they're very fascinating, especially for anybody who wants to understand things about the human psyche. And when we cease to understand the world, it's a lot about innovation, scientific innovation, people who have pushed things forward uh, like Einstein and, and, and others um, throughout history. An innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce, retail, or tech landscape that you feel excited about? Ooh, that's tough. That's real tough. Um, I got to admit, I'm not an enormous techie. Uh, I mean, it could be something related to something that you use in your e-commerce or marketing that, that you find interesting. I think what's fascinating is the stuff that Amazon continues to do as a business owner, the way that they are taking over everything like pharma, supplements, video games, movies, TV. I think, you know, what, however you feel about Amazon and, and Bezos, you, it's undeniable. Like that speaks even more if you hate them, but you still have to use them. That speaks even more that they've built something unbelievable. So like, if I was going to choose one, like, the fact that Amazon now has a, a gaming thing that's on the cloud that you don't even need a, a gaming system for, you just need their remote, like that blows my mind. Uh, a business or productivity tool that you would recommend or a productivity tip? I love Shopify. Um, I think things that keep you better organized are always helpful. So, you know, we have a Slack board, it's not as used as I'd like it to be, uh, but, that's good. And then just utilizing as much, you know, simple technology, like a lot of our communication now with stuff is done through things like Zoom or WhatsApp uh, and using those platforms, the social media platforms best you can. Um, I do agree with people like Gary Vee where, where content is king. I mean, it, it still is. And I don't think that, I don't think that equation is changing anytime soon. A peer entrepreneur or business person whom you look up to or someone who inspires you? very inspired by Elon Musk um, pretty much from from every perspective uh, and and I think his approach is really if I was to distill it down like how he discusses taking a first principles approach towards building things engineering things uh, that's very much something that I try to infuse into our product development as well I think Elon Musk uh, is is wired a little bit differently also. I think yes. he's, he's, he's also um, described that, I think, on the Joe Rogan podcast. So, yep. so yeah, his, his, work, his brain is a little bit different. Um, best business advice you have ever received or you would give to other entrepreneurs? Oh, boy. I, I don't think I have a soundbite or a clip. I think what I can best give people practically is uh, I was encouraged, and this is going to be another book recommendation. Uh, I was encouraged to buy the book E-Myth and we did a little bit of E-Myth coaching. And I think that was very valuable. Uh, I think having a business coach can be valuable, especially when you're in a partnership because it's an independent outsider where it doesn't just become two opinions that can't re reach a resolution. Um, so I think having an arbitrator or a, a business coach, if you can afford it, is great. If not, there's something called SCORE, which uh, is people who have established successful businesses and they, they offer uh, free mentoring for businesses. So I think utilize that. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better answer, but I think at least if I can give you know, resources for other entrepreneurs, I think those are incredibly valuable. No, that's, that's great. And last question, uh, do you believe in luck? Um, and if yes, why? I do. Um, I wish I had more of it. Okay. Um, I think you can enhance your luck through hard work for sure. But I do believe in luck because I've seen a lot of people fall into things um, that seem to defy the laws that are traditionally taught on what will get you success. So I do believe in luck. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, that, those were all the questions that I had today um, uh, on my podcast. So really appreciate you sharing your story, um, your, your business insights, and, uh, and helping other entrepreneurs uh, 
uh, learn and grow also. So thank you so much for joining today at Trip Talks. Uh, would you want to share, like if someone wants to buy your products or uh, want to, wants to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Sure. Uh, so first I'd like to thank you for having me as well. This was, this was almost like therapy with some of those questions. So, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love those questions. They were great. And I think it brings out really good uh, answers uh, and self-analysis as well. So um, yeah, so our, our website is elemental.fit. Um, if you do have uh, international listener, listeners, we do have a, an e, a website for the EU, which is elementalformulations.eu, a little more of a mouthful. Um, I'm on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active, at Ben Esgro. And then I, if I have a purely educational uh, channel on, on Instagram as well called Suppsci, S-U-P-P-S-C-I. So supplement science. Okay. Um, and that is if, if people are interested in, in the science of supplements and how to better think and approach making supplement pur purchases, uh, I, I run that just as, you know, uh, almost pay it forward type thing. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say those are probably the best channels to, to reach me, get in touch or, or support us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Really, really appreciate it. For sure. Let me end the...